You're walking home when suddenly a police car pulls up. You're arrested in front of your neighbours, handcuffed, searched and taken away for a crime you didn't commit. You're blindfolded, stripped and thrown into a cell. But this isn't a real prison, it's a psychology experiment. I had no idea it would turn out this way. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. In this video, we're continuing our exploration of the social influence topic, and specifically conformity. In the previous video, we defined conformity as a change in behaviour or belief as a result of real or imagined group pressure. In this video, we're exploring what happens when ordinary people are placed into roles with extraordinary power dynamics. Can the situation itself make good people do bad things? And what does it tell us about the power of social roles? To answer this, we're going to look at the famous Stanford Prison Experiment. Social roles are the patterns of behaviour expected of individuals in specific positions or social contexts. Think of the different roles you switch between every day. As a student, you may be respectful, formal, obedient to your teacher, hopefully. As a friend, you might joke, tease, share personal things, but as a customer or an employee, you stay polite, neutral and professional. Each of these roles comes with a script, expected ways of speaking, acting, even thinking. That's what we mean by conformity to social roles. But what's this got to do with prisons? Back in the 1970s, the US faced massive issues with violence and abuse in prisons. Zimbardo wrote, the experience of prison creates an intense hatred and disrespect in most prisoners for the guards. And the toll it takes on the human spirit is incalculable. Zimbardo's study sought to test two competing ideas, the dispositional hypothesis. The violence and abuse in prisons are due to the personalities of the people involved, sadistic guards and criminal-minded prisoners. Or the situational hypothesis, the environment itself, the prison setting and power dynamics causes ordinary people to behave in extreme ways. This was no small study. It was commissioned by the US Navy who turned to Philip Zimbardo and Stanford University to investigate. The study involved 24 male American college students, all recruited through a newspaper advertisement promising $15 a day. They were told the study was about prison life and that it would last for one to two weeks. Each volunteer was carefully assessed before the study to ensure they were mentally and physically healthy. Once selected, they were randomly assigned to take on the role of either a prisoner or a guard. The experiment took place in the basement of Stanford University's psychology department, which was converted into a realistic mock prison. It featured barred cells, a solitary confinement room known as the hole, and standardised uniforms to enhance the sense of realism. Guards wore khaki uniforms whistles, nightsticks and reflective sunglasses, all designed to remove their personal identity. They were told to maintain order in the prison, but they were not allowed to use physical violence. Importantly, Zimbardo himself played the role of the prison superintendent. The experience began with a shock. Prisoners were arrested at home by real police, blindfolded and brought to the mock prison. They were deloused, stripped and given identical clothing labelled only with ID numbers. To reinforce their new identity, they were never referred to by name, only by number. A key concept central to the experiment is de-individuation. This refers to the loss of personal identity and a diminished sense of personal responsibility which often leads people to act in ways they normally wouldn't. In the prison, anonymity came from uniforms, ID numbers and strict routines, stripping away individuality and encouraging conformity to social roles. So what happened? Well, on day two, the prisoners rebelled. They shouted, swore at the guards and blocked their cell doors. In response, the guards imposed increasingly harsh punishments, removing privileges and tightening control. Very quickly, the prisoners' resistance faded. They became anxious, withdrawn and passive. Five of the prisoners were released early due to severe emotional breakdowns. One prisoner went on a hunger strike, but rather than support him, the other prisoners saw him as a 
troublemaker. The guards adapted rapidly to their roles. They harassed prisoners, conducted midnight roll calls, and punished even small disobedience. <laughs> One guard locked a prisoner in solitary confinement overnight. The behaviour of the guards and the prisoners got so out of hand that this two week study had to be stopped on the sixth day. Many guards became increasingly cruel and sadistic, and perhaps most shockingly, when the experiment ended early, the guards were disappointed. They had been enjoying their power. Good evening, gentlemen. How about we make this one a night to remember? The Stanford Prison Experiment revealed how strongly social roles can influence behaviour. It showed that it's not just who we are, our personality, that shapes our actions, but the situations we're placed in. Even healthy, stable individuals can conform to extreme behaviours when placed in an environment that strips identity and reinforces power hierarchies. However, whilst the Stanford Prison Experiment revealed powerful insights insights into human behaviour, it also raised important questions, both about its scientific strengths and its serious ethical concerns. One key strength of Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment was the high level of control over variables. Participants were carefully screened before the study began to ensure they were emotionally stable and free from psychological issues, which helped reduce the risk of individual differences affecting the results. In addition, random allocation of participants participants to the roles of prisoner or guard helped to reduce participant bias and ensured that any differences in behaviour were likely due to the roles assigned rather than the personality traits. As a result of these controls, the study had good internal validity as the behaviour observed could be confidently linked to the influence of the social roles and the simulated prison environment. However, the Stanford Prison Experiment also had several important weaknesses. One major limit was its lack of generalizability. All participants were male American college students, which means the findings may not reflect how individuals from different backgrounds, cultures, or age groups would behave in similar situations. A second issue was the presence of demand characteristics. Since participants were aware they were taking part in a psychological study, they may have altered their behavior to fit in with what they thought was expected of them, rather than acting naturally. This concern is heightened by the fact that even Zimbardo himself conformed to a role. As the prison superintendent, he failed to remain an objective researcher and became too involved in the study. The Stanford Prison Experiment has been further questioned in terms of ecological validity. Although the environment was designed to resemble a real prison, it remained an artificial simulation. Participants were aware that it was a study and could technically withdraw at any time, which is unlike the inescapable, long-term nature of actual prison. Prisons. This raises questions about how far the findings can be applied to real life. However, several aspects of the study did enhance its realism. The prison setting was physically convincing, set in the basement of Stanford's psychology department and equipped with barred cells and a solitary confinement room. External professionals, including a former inmate and a prison chaplain, reportedly believed the environment closely resembled real prison life. Additionally, participants' behaviour, such as guards volunteering to do overtime without pay, and prisoners referring to themselves by their ID numbers suggest that the experience felt psychologically real, lending weight to the study's ecological validity despite its limitations. Finally, the Stanford Prison Experiment has also raised serious ethical concerns. Whilst participants gave informed consent, they could not have fully anticipated the intensity and emotional strain the study would involve. This raises questions about whether their consent was truly informed. Additionally, the study caused significant psychological harm. Several participants experienced extreme emotional distress, including anxiety and breakdowns, prompting criticism over whether such outcomes should have been predicted and prevented. Although the contract that participants signed stated that participants had the right to withdraw at any time, some reported feeling unable to leave, suggesting that their autonomy was compromised. Zimbardo himself later acknowledged this ethical lapse, admitting, I became too involved in the role. I forgot 
that I was a psychologist. His dual role as both lead researcher and prison superintendent created a conflict of interest and contributed to the ethical failings of the study. So we've just witnessed how ordinary people can slip into roles of power and cruelty in the Stanford prison experiment. But there's another mind-blowing study that takes this even further. Next up, Milgram's obedience experiments. Prepare to be shocked by how authority can control us. To watch that video, just click on the screen now. And for more psychology resources to help you with your A-levels, don't forget to check out the Bear It In Mind website. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.